Hello. Um, so, I'm on to uh, my third Prime Minister for today. I tend to do these in patches of three. Um, and that is William Lamb, the second Viscount Melbourne. Um, Melbourne was in office for quite a while, actually, but he is not among our more outstanding Prime Ministers. Um, so, like, as with the others, we'll just go give a general outline of his life and his time in office. Um, any questions, feel free to ask. So, um, Henry uh, William Lamb, to give him his real name, uh, bearing in mind this is still a point when Prime Ministers were known by their titles. William Lamb was born in London in 1779. Um, the Wikipedia article doesn't say specifically where he was born. Um, but he was born in London in 1779. He was a Whig and he served two terms of office in 1834, briefly, from July to November 1834, then again from April 1835 to August 1841. That's a total of about seven years. So he was in office for quite a while, but um, he's not seen as one of our more remarkable prime ministers. This was in part because his era was slightly less tumultuous than his predecessors, his immediate predecessors, although some of those issues are still ongoing and certainly the Chartist movement and so on was still ongoing at the time. Um, the Wikipedia article basically introduces him as follows. He is best for known for his intense and successful mentoring of Queen Victoria at the ages 18 to 21 in the ways of politics. Historians conclude that Melbourne does not rank high as a prime minister, so there's no great foreign wars or domestic issues to handle. He lacked major achievements and he enunciated no grand principles, but he was kind, honest and not self-seeking. Melbourne was dismissed by the King in 1834, that's King William IV, um, and he was the last Prime Minister to have been dismissed by a monarch. Um, of course, uh, I'm saying that he isn't ranked as one of our outstanding Prime Ministers, but of all British Prime Ministers, um, he had the largest city named after him, which is, of course is Melbourne, Australia. That's named after Viscount Melbourne. Um, I believe Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is named after Pitt the Elder. Um, but Melbourne, um, Australia is named in honour of William Lamb, second Viscount Melbourne. Um, he was a popular figure in, amongst his contemporaries. Um, he was seen as an amicable figure. Um, and he certainly uh, had a social life that included some well-known people. Um, although he was caught up in a number of high-profile scandals, um, one of the most, most notorious came uh, in 1836, I believe, when um, he was involved in a sex scandal. This involved an attempt at blackmail from the husband of a close friend, um, society beauty and early feminist Caroline Norton. Basically, the husband demanded £1,400, which was a huge sum in those days. I mean, he was turned down and he accused Melbourne of having an affair with his wife, whether Melbourne did or not. He never particularly had a reputation as a womanizer that I know of, so I'm not sure if that was a claim that stacked up. At a time, such a scandal would have been enough to bring down the government. By the 19th century, the press was starting to get a lot more powerful. Um, so and I have to say that something that surprises me is we sort of assume that it wasn't until the mid-20th century, you know, the power of the tabloids and so on, but even then, they had quite a lot of power. Um, apparently, the king and even the Duke of Wellington, who was a Tory, whereas um, Melbourne was a Whig, encouraged him to stay on. So the fact that the government survived the scandal says something about how much his contemporaries held him. Um, but as the historian Boyd Hilton concludes, it is irrefutable that Melbourne had a problematic personal life. Um, you know, I'm saying he didn't have a reputation as a womanizer, but he certainly had a reputation. Uh, spanking sessions with aristocratic ladies were harmless. Um, some of his other exploits, maybe not so much. Um, I'm wondering what the basis for this is. Not so much the whippings administered to orphan girls taken in their household as objects of charity. Now, if that's true, that's pretty awful. Um, I don't know how much truth there is in that, but if it's true, then it would certainly contrast this amicable image that he has. Um, 
Melbourne, uh, like the article says, was uh, basically an advisor to the young Queen Victoria, much the way, same way that Lord, the elderly Churchill was for the young Queen Elizabeth II. Um, in the film, the young Victoria actually, Melbourne is portrayed by Paul Bettany, although in the film he's portrayed as a younger man than he actually was at the time. I believe at that time he was in his, um, he, well, if he was born in 1779, Victoria ascended to throne in 1837. He would have been well in the Middle Age at that point. Whereas in the young Victoria, obviously Paul Bettany is a younger man. Um, uh, his wife supposedly had uh, an affair with Lord Byron. So in many ways, we could say he's almost like the Bill Clinton of British politics at this time. Um, although whether he was seen as uh, good looking or not, I don't know. Um, among his government's acts were a reduction in the number of capital offences. Um, Britain still had public hangings at this time. Um, reforms of local government and the reform of the poor laws. This restricted the terms in which the poor were allowed relief and established compulsory admission to workhouses for the impoverished. So in contrast to the other great wig, Charles Gray, um, I think we can evaluate that Melbourne as having quite a um, negative legacy. Uh, I mean, the workhouses were terrible places. They divided families and the poor would rather die on the streets in many ways than be sent to a workhouse. Of course, um, Oliver Twist is set at this time. So, and bear in mind, this was not a Tory. This was a Whig Prime Minister. So certainly some of those aspects um, are a lot more, would be a lot more controversial by today's standards. Um, Melbourne's role as a mentor to Victoria subsided as uh, after she married Prince Albert. Um, he died at Brockett Hall in Hertfordshire in 1848 at the age of 69. Um, so that's Viscount Melbourne. Quite a, I think he would be someone who by today's standards probably would be subject to all sorts of um, tabloid rumours in much the way that Edward Heath is today. Um, I'm saying that because uh, certainly some of the things that I've read there, in fact, I've just been reading this now, some of those things I wasn't so familiar with. Um, so maybe there is more to Melbourne than meets the eye. Of course, uh, we have to be fair, there may not be any truth in some of those claims, but certainly some of his domestic policies. And again, I apologise because maybe I'm being a bit biased here in my analysis. Um, major acts during his time was the dissenters' marriage bill of 1836. Um, Caroline Norton, she was instrumental in that, which legalised civil marriage outside of the church. Um, so that's some of the things. Some of the things to remember, Melbourne in Australia is named after him, uh, and he tutored the young Queen Victoria, well, at least mentored her. Um, she was quite a headstrong young woman. Um, she, uh, he, um, excuse me, he married um, Lady Ponsonby, Caroline Ponsonby Lamb. Um, she uh, had two miscarriages. She gave birth to the only child, George Augustus Frederick, in 1807. She was devoted to him, uh, but the son was epileptic and mentally handicapped and had to be cared for constantly which is a bit like our current Prime Minister who also had a severely disabled son. Um, so that's Melbourne. Um, not an outstanding Prime Minister, but quite uh, an interesting character for some of his exploits outside Downing Street. Um, Lord Melbourne, uh, there we have it, 1779 to 1848.